Welcome to our weekly three-minute therapy podcast. I'm Dr. Michael Edelstein, a clinical psychologist. I have a website, 3 therapycom I'm here with my co-host, Mick Berry, also an REBT expert. REBT is Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy, a which created a revolution in the psychotherapy world in the mid 50s. And the man behind that was Albert Ellis, who's written over 80 books on the subject. REBT, Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy, is based on the main premise that our emotions come from our thinking about situations, not from situations themselves. And if you're familiar with cognitive behavior therapy, then that uh, premise is familiar to you. And disturbed emotions like anxiety, depression, anger, and uh, hopelessness come from a particular type of thinking, and that's thinking in terms of demands. Must, shoulds, supposed tos, have tos, demands we put on ourselves, others, and situations. Today, we are going to be discussing jealousy, and uh, jealousy is an emotion, and jealousy is a disturbed emotion, not a reasonable or appropriate emotion. Would you agree, Mick? Uh, yeah, if we, uh, if you're defining jealousy the way I would, and I think most people would define it the way we would, which let me take a stab at it, would be not just envying somebody, but feeling anxiety about whatever it is they have that you don't have. Yes, I think that's one type of jealousy. Uh, I think jealousy could show itself in two different ways. One is in terms of anxiety or insecurity, and that comes from a demand, a must, because I prefer to be number one in my partner's eyes. Therefore, I absolutely must. I have to be or else I'm no good. I'm a loser. So that would be the anxiety or the insecurity. But also another part of jealousy uh, that some people experience is anger, a demand on others. My partner must not flirt with someone else or else he or she is no good. Condemning your partner for doing what you're demanding that he or she not do. Yeah, Mick? Yeah, also, we could take it farther. My partner must not sleep with somebody else. My partner must not end my relationship and fall in love with somebody else. It yeah. could go that far. Exactly. Or this yeah. person that I am enamored with is in love with somebody else, and therefore I am enraged about this, or I am have anxiety about it and thanks for pointing out yes anger is another manifestation common manifestation of jealousy and uh so famous that there have been many songs written about it one of which is frankie and johnny yeah yeah he was her man but he done her wrong <laughs> yeah good point and jo john lennon wrote a song called i'm just a jealous guy so, yeah and... uh, so jealousy is popular in in the culture and has always been yeah and, and, and also eric clapton created a whole album about it layla uh wow. songs titled why does love have to be so sad and the song layla you got me on my knees i'm begging darling please why don't you ease my worried mind yeah yeah, I'm trying to think of something from Chaucer about jealousy, but nothing comes to mind. <laughs> well, uh, there is, of course, Shakespeare with Othello, in which Othello gives uh, uh, Iago gives Othello a speech about beware of jealousy, beware of jealousy. And what ends up happening is Iago, to bring Othello down, convinces him that his wife Desdemona has been unfaithful, and Othello kills her. Is that where the uh, phrase, 
uh, something about jealousy is the devil with green eyes, something like that. It might be Shakespeare invented many phrases and uh, actually invented many words too. Mm -hmm. It now, might. the good news is if you feel jealous, you can do something about it because uh, it comes from your must, as Mick and I have been discussing. So what you can do is question, challenge, and contradict your must. For example, if, you're, if you have insecure jealousy, I must be number one in my partner's eyes or else I'm no good, then you could ask yourself, Although I would like to be number one, it would be advantageous to be number one from my perspective. It would be lovely to be number one. But what is the evidence I absolutely must be? I have to be number one simply because I passionately prefer to. And the answer is there is no must. All musts are fictions. There's no reason why you absolutely have to be anything you want to be. And... Uh, and once you question, challenge, and contradict that must again and again and again and again and uproot your must, then you'd have a much more uh, comfortable, uh, undisturbed life. Mick? Yeah, and I wanted to say sometimes people, in fact, when I hear people object to REBT, they say, oh, well, it's only surface. It doesn't get at the marrow, well, that depends on how viscerally, passionately, thoroughly, rigorously you dispute the irrational thought. I myself have had, to, have told myself I didn't have to, but I astutely worked it by telling myself it doesn't matter how much I want something. I could want something more than I could imagine wanting anything in the world. I could be wanting this thing more than I could imagine I have ever wanted anything, and I still don't have to have it. And if I don't get to have it, I can still accept my life. I can, I am still acceptable. I can still accept myself. I can still find ways to be happy. I do not have to have what I want, no matter how much I want it. Rigorously, vis vigorously, passionately dispute the must, reinforce the rational thinking over and over and over, practice, practice, practice. It gets easier, it becomes more natural, it becomes more a part of you, and it becomes as deep as you can make it. Yeah, and also when you're doing, as Mick uh, correctly advises, you can also question, challenge, and contradict the derivatives of must, and one is, uh, I must be number one in my partner's eyes, and if I'm not, I can't stand it. So you can question that. What is the evidence I can't stand what I'm standing? And what I really mean is I'm stay I can't stand it well right now, but I but I'm standing it. I'm standing it poorly. Another one is uh, awfulizing. What's the evidence that? If I'm not number one in my partner's eyes, it's awful, terrible, and horrible. It's the end of the world. And again, you could show yourself, obviously, the world will go on. You'll go on within the world. So it's hardly the end of the world. And convincing yourself it's the end of the world does no good, just makes you feel bad and uh, makes no sense. Mick? And I wanted to say something about the concept of not being able to stand something, thinking I can't stand it. I, for the longest time, worked it by thinking, okay, I can stand this, I'm going to stand it, and worked, worked, worked to stand something. But then you astutely pointed out to me, well, you're going to be standing it no matter what you do. You just might not be standing it as easily or as relaxed as you would like to do. And so then I realized, gee, I don't have to work to stand something. What I can do is realize I am going to be standing this. I would like to stand it stress free, anxiety free, and that's something I can work towards. But thinking I can't stand something is utterly ridiculous because I'm going to be standing it. Even if I feel awful, I'm still standing it. There is no not standing anything. That is an impossibility unless you choose to kill yourself 
And even then you could have stood it, you just decided you couldn't. And that's um, a very irrational, that's the most irrational and non-coping reaction to the illusion that something cannot be stood. Yeah, exactly. Another, and, deri another derivative of um, I must be number one in my partner's eyes is self-downing. I'm no good if my partner prefers someone else to me. And uh, you can question that and show yourself there's never any evidence you're no good. All we can show is no matter how poorly you do or no matter how many people dislike you or reject you, you're still just an imperfect human who acts imperfectly, not a loser, not a worthless person, not a no good person. Nick? Yes. And along with that being no good or good, really what we're getting at is I am acceptable and I determine whether or not I accept myself. Even if I'm not accepting myself, I'm still acceptable. I'm just not accepting myself. So if I'm thinking I'm no good, really what I can do to help myself is remember, I am always acceptable. I accept myself. I don't need other people to accept me. And in fact, if I'm not accepting myself, it doesn't matter how much I could have the entire world accepting me, but if I'm not accepting myself, I will not feel okay. And the proof of that is there have been many successful people who have been adored by throngs of human beings who ended up uh, committing suicide because they were not able to accept themselves or the world they lived in. Yeah, and uh, conversely, if the whole world thinks you're wonderful and you don't accept yourself, then you're going to have a uh, very disturbed life because putting yourself down leads to depression, self-pity, sometimes suicide. Yeah, I wanted to correct myself in saying these people couldn't accept themselves. I think that's incorrect. They didn't accept themselves. That doesn't mean that they couldn't. The tragedy would be that they didn't accept themselves. As we like to say in REBT, we like to use semantic precision. And as my sister astutely pointed out, semantic precision is the most important in our thinking because that determines how we feel and how we behave and how we're able to interact in the world. Yep, yep, very good, very good. Um, well, I think we pretty much covered jealousy. Did you have any last things to say about it, Mick? I would say that no matter how strong our irrational thoughts may feel, no matter how much anxiety we may have, no matter how much depression or anger we may have, it is always reducible and it is always possible to improve and improve and improve. I work REBT a great deal. I still do, uh, of course, and I have been as depressed and anxious and angry as I think it's possible for any human to feel. I didn't act on these things, but I certainly was feeling the weight of my emotional disturbance. And I do not think I'm unique. I think I'm simply another human being who has benefited by REBT. And I think everybody can benefit from thinking more rationally so that they can have a more productive and a happy life with all sorts of wonderful surprises coming their way. Very good. And uh, my final word on this subject is go for unconditional acceptance unconditionally accepting yourself, unconditionally accepting others, and unconditionally accepting the conditions of your life and looking for ways you can improve your own actions, the actions of others, how you can influence them, and the conditions of your life. Nick? And I just wanted to say accepting does not mean resigning yourself to circumstances you don't like. You can still 
try to change your circumstances, try to improve your behavior while you are imminently accepting that there is no reason things should not be the way they are. But let's see how we can make them better. Yeah, and I'd like to reinforce uh, what you said earlier, Mick. Accepting it doesn't mean you give up. That's the way it is. It Things don't matter. But it means not putting yourself down, others down, or life down, and trying to change what you can change. And I okay. would add that I think the reason we're able to communicate through to people through Zoom and microphones and video and everything else is some human being saw a problem and came up with a solution for it. And rather than stewing or getting angry, they used their head, accepted the circumstances, accepted the details. Ah, how can we work with this? There's something called electricity. Let's see what can happen. Yeah, and even if you're stewing and upsetting yourself, that doesn't mean you have to give up. You can still work toward improving yourself and influencing others positively and improving the world. Uh, the people who did these great inventions may have had all kinds of emotional disturbance, but they didn't give up. They continue to work at it. Yeah, that's a very good point because we don't have to get disturbed about being disturbed. Even if I am depressed, I can still do things to help myself. So I don't have to be undepressed in order to still move forward. And I will simply be moving forward in a more enjoyable way if I can get rid of my depression. But we don't have to say, oh, gosh, I'm depressed. I can't do anything right now. Yeah, and that... Uh... Disturbance, Mick, just outlined, is called, or we call it, secondary disturbance. Sometimes it's called discomfort disturbance. But uh, so you don't have to disturb yourself about being disturbed. Okay, I think uh, we said a lot about the subject. And uh, hopefully you can use some of this information to get over your own jealous feelings or help someone else get over their own jealous jealous feelings. It's not rocket science. It's simply looking at the beliefs that's causing your disturbance and uprooting them. Well, thank you very much, Mick, my co-host for this great podcast. And that's Mick Berry. I'm Dr. Michael Edelstein, clinical psychologist, author of Three Minute Therapy. And I also want to thank our tech engineer, Chris Rossini, for uh, without whose help we could not do this. If you have thoughts on what we discussed, comment below. If you found it useful in any way, give us a thumbs up. Suggest subjects that you'd like us to discuss. Volunteer if you'd like to be a guest. And from time to time, we do have guests. And we could help you with a problem or help you with a client of yours who has a problem and subscribe to the three minute therapy podcast to stay on the rational side of life.